rather than looking at yourself or your body as a problem, that's where looking at things through this lens of healing and uncovering and learning and unlearning and unpacking all of these pieces of yourself is just a much kinder and gentler approach to moving in a different direction in your life and and building toward a better version of yourself or a more healed version of yourself. Hello and welcome. Thank you everyone for coming back to Care So Much. I'm so excited for our guest today. Her name is Molly Goodman and she is a life coach who helps people come back home to themselves and disrupt toxic diet culture. I'm going to go ahead and throw it right over to Molly and have Molly start chatting right away about what it is that we're talking about today and why she cares so much about it. Thank you so much, Lillian, for having me. Um, My name is Molly Goodman. I'm a life coach. And the main thing that I help people with is taking so much focus and emphasis off of their bodies so that they can live and pursue their lives in a way that feels good to them. I think the thing that is so important to know is that we've all been Mm -hmm. programmed. (laughs) We've been told and sold these stories for such a long time for eons, decades, generations, that being smaller, whether that's literally or figuratively, playing smaller in your life is how you succeed. It's how you fit in. It's how you get what you want in the world. At the same time, we're also told these stories of, well, you have to speak up for yourself. You have to be bold and big and energetic. And so you're basically being thrown between these two opposing stories, which can really turn into this, well, I'm too much and I'm not enough all at the same time. Yeah. Why do you start from the place of hate your body less? What is, what's kind of the point of, of open the door there for people? It's important to start where people are. And so, so many people in my community, on social media, my clients that come to me, they're coming from that place of hating their body. (laughs) And rather than bypassing their lived experience and negating how they really feel right now in this moment. It's so much more effective to meet somebody and validate those feelings and say, yeah, I get it. I see you. I honor you. And that feeling, while it's valid, is something that you can work to shift if you want to. If you want to feel differently about your body and how you view it, you can do that work to get there. But you don't have to bypass what you're actually feeling to do that work. And it's actually much more beneficial to do it in a layered, methodical way rather than just jumping to, I love myself, everything's fine, because that doesn't really work. There is sort of this attitude of almost like that toxic positivity that we see in a lot of spaces Mm -hmm. that like somehow not only like, I don't feel this way now, but like there was times where not only did I feel like. I was fat and hated that, (laughs) but also Mm -hmm. I felt like, and I'm failing to love my body. So they're mad at me too. (laughs) Hi guys. We lost a little bit of the audio for this episode. So I just wanted to hop in and explain that this was a point where Molly talked a little bit about why body positivity, which used to be a social justice movement has sort of been co-opted by social media in this space and sort of reframed in a way that is at times often quite harmful. But let's get you right back into the episode. That history, super interesting. And I'll put some resources in the description for anybody who wants to learn more about that because that's that's a whole other episode. That's a whole other conversation. We're not going to unpack that today. There's a whole lot of reasons why. Definitely very interesting if you, if you have only experienced um, body positivity through sort of the social media hashtag as it lives today, it is very worth going in and and reading and learning some of that history. And there's lots of terms that I'm familiar with and I'm imagining my listeners are familiar with to an extent. One of the terms that I've noticed you use is body acceptance and I've heard body neutrality before. So sometimes I use them interchangeably, but in general, body acceptance is really just accepting that you have a body and that it is what it is and that you exist in that body. There's probably another term that's layered in there too, body respect. Mm -hmm. Um, 
think acceptance and respect and just acknowledging like, hey, this is my body is a really powerful way of reclaiming your space. And so when I talk about body acceptance, it's really about saying, okay, yes, I am here. This is me. And I'm accepting that this is what it is. And I think where neutrality, body neutrality comes into play is not necessarily loving your body, not necessarily hating your body. But again, it's a little bit of that acceptance. Mm -hmm. But on this way, it's a little bit more of that neutral feeling of not necessarily feeling positive or negative and just not even fully regarding your body as it's not disregarding your body, but it's not putting so much stock in your body. It's a little bit like it just kind of is and it's there. Whereas I feel like acceptance is a little bit more it is and it's there and I'm okay with it. Neutrality is just this middle ground Mm -hmm. and body acceptance is more, I'm okay with it as it is. I may not love it, but I'm okay with it being here. That's such a a helpful difference between the way that we kind of use the term body positivity now and Mm -hmm. sort of, as you were talking about previously, the idea of like a step in the right direction. I think another Mm -hmm. sort of similar piece there is the idea of like, you're fixing yourself as you're going Mm. through this process, like you're fixing yourself or you're doing like self-help stuff versus the idea of healing and what sort of the difference Mm. between those two ideas are. So the thing with right now in our sort of cultural moment that we're in, there's a lot of this self-help rhetoric out there that talks a lot about, you know, here are the 10 ways to fix this or here's the five (laughs) reasons that this isn't working. It's a lot of these prescriptive ideas of how you can fix a problem rather than looking at yourself or your body as a problem. That's where looking at things through this lens of healing and uncovering and learning and unlearning and unpacking all of these pieces of yourself, just a much kinder and gentler approach to moving in a different direction in your life and and building toward a better version of yourself or a more healed version of yourself, a more whole version at that too. And I think when we come at it from the lens of fixing, mm-hmm. it just continues to tell you that something is wrong with you rather than giving yourself so much grief and so much pain and so much. I mean, yes, I think there's, there's a ton of work in this of grieving yourself, your past versions of your body, et cetera. But rather than coming at it from that harsh lens of, well, I need, I am wrong and therefore I need to be fixed. Mm -hmm. It's I am, therefore I deserve care. That's so much more powerful and uplifting and healing. And it gives you such a different baseline to come from than this, kind of controlling and manipulative stance that I think so much of that fixing mentality can have. I know I use this term all the time and I've also used it in spaces where I sort of have just started using it as like a shorthand thing. And Mm -hmm. I now realize that some people don't know what I'm talking about (laughs) because I've done a lot of work on things that I forget other people haven't had that (laughs) same experience, which is the idea of toxic diet culture. A lot of times people hear the phrase diet culture, and they immediately go to a specific diet Mm. like keto or Weight Watchers or Paleo or Whole30 or whatever. Diet culture is actually the system of beliefs that being in a thin, small body is the most important thing that somebody can do. It's the systemic belief that small bodies are better and that you should stop at nothing to make that happen for yourself. Diet culture is really the system rather than a specific diet. So it's all of the commercials, the messaging, the diet pills, the diet books, the, you know, my fitness pal, it's all of the things wrapped into, it's the the not seeing fat characters in the media, or if there are fat characters in the media, they're the butt of every joke. It's the the systemic way that fat bodies are villainized and seen as unworthy. When we talk about diet culture, 
It also is important to note that it's built in number one, racism and Mm -hmm. fat phobia. And it's also built in capitalism. Diet companies make billions upon billions of dollars off of us every single year. When you look at it that way, it's not that these diet companies and diet culture in general are really doing anything to create longstanding change or help. They're doing things to make money. They're profiting off of our self-hatred. That's what diet culture is. It's the system. It's the the setup of beliefs that is meant to keep people constantly trying to fix themselves and pay money to get smaller. Though I was nodding vigorously throughout that, <laughs> um, as I'm sure the listeners heard. Unpacking that and sort of understanding what that is, that it's not the diet that you were on. It's not the thing that you were doing. Like it's, it's with so many other social justice things that we hear about, particularly in the U.S. We do a lot of individual responsibility as opposed to criticizing the systemic structural mm-hmm. problems. Totally. If someone has been really caught up in this toxic diet culture, they're sort of in it, but they don't know what the other option is. What is the other way to approach eating and food? And I'm seeing the struggles, I'm seeing the problems, but I live my life week to week on points, or I only mm-hmm. eat protein mm-hmm. because carbs are evil. What's sort of that first way to get out of that? And what's the other option sort of at the end of that line? For me and for a lot of my clients and for folks that I know, exploring the concept of intuitive eating and exploring what it means to come to food from an anti-diet lens and a health at every size lens is a really important first step. And um, I'm sure that you can share resources Mm -hmm. um, about those various things. But in general, it's about learning to uncouple your body and your size from health to uncouple morality from food. Once you start to go down that path and start to really understand and listen to whether it's podcasts or read books or explore social media accounts that really portray these things, it's looking at things like intuitive eating and health at every size, understanding that there are other ways to think about food. There are other ways to learn how to engage with food and how to engage in your body It takes time and it takes a lot of patience and practice to get there. But basically, it's about learning to move from that lens of control into trust and to trusting that you are your number one best advocate, you're your number one best caretaker, and that you know your body better than any diet plan ever could. And understand, okay, there is a world where... I can make a choice for my body based on what feels good in it, what sounds good, what tastes good. I can do all of those things and they all kind of work in tandem with one another and that I don't have to live in this sort of very narrow path where I'm only able to use food as quote fuel. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it's about really starting to look at the nuance and the complexity of of food and how it's not just something that sustains us, that there's, there are social aspects to food. There are psychological aspects to food. There are so many other things and beautiful things about food and eating that diet culture, unfortunately, tends to strip away. When you start to reintroduce those things back into your life and you start looking at things through an anti-diet lens, giving yourself the perspective of, oh, okay, you know what? Maybe there is a world where I don't have to be afraid of these cookies. I don't have to fear that I'm doing something wrong or that I am a horrible person for indulging in this dessert. A whole new world opens up for you. (laughs) And again, it takes time and not everybody is going to have this sort of linear path. I know that when I was first introduced to intuitive eating, it very much felt like, okay, yeah, that's great for somebody else, but not for me. (laughs) And it took time and repetition and being 
in the right spaces and in community with the right people to really get myself into the headspace of, okay, yeah, this is the next move for me. That's not this constant controlling and manipulation of my body. You talked about a few different elements, that diet culture, and then the counter to that diet culture. And one of them is the idea of food having morality. What are some of the ways that you sort of look at food as morally neutral? For someone who maybe thinks that they're already doing that, but haven't looked too closely Mm. at food and morality. When I think about how I approach food now, it's from such a a different space. It's from a much more self-connected and deeply grounded sort of primal space almost of how am I appealing to all of the different parts of my body, right? How am I appealing to my gut? How am I appealing to my taste buds? How am I appealing to what's going to keep me energized? What's going to make me happy? Thinking about all of those different things and choosing things based on a myriad of different criteria rather than just, okay, well, here is this one thing that I'm allowed to eat because it's quote unquote good for me. And I think a lot of folks get to a place when they come into this side of sort of undieting and (laughs) learning how to eat more intuitively. And they think, well, if I just listen to my body and, you know, only eat when I'm hungry and stop when I'm full, or I only, you know, I eat anything that I want, I'm just going to eat cookies all day. Like, okay, you might eventually, you know, Mm -hmm. maybe on day one, sure. Day two, okay, maybe. Day three and four, you might start to get sick of those cookies. Once you start giving yourself full permission. And that's really at the crux of all of this Mm -hmm. is that when you give yourself full permission to eat whatever you want, whenever you want. So that means it's not that you have to stop eating past eight o'clock at night. (laughs) It's not that you can only eat lunch at exactly 12 on the dot. It means that you can have a second helping if you're still hungry. (laughs) It means that, hey, maybe you have an extra slice of pizza just because you're having a really awesome time with your friends and the pizza tastes really good. Mm -hmm. And that none of that is wrong. And that there's no right or wrong when it comes to nourishing your body because you get to choose what that means. Eventually, as you practice this, as you continue to practice that full permission, you become more in tune with what your body's asking for. I can tell you there are days where I absolutely only have frozen foods or things that are really convenient. And maybe it's pizza for lunch and pasta for dinner. And then maybe the next day I feel a little bit more like, okay, yeah, I could use some greens. And I very purposefully decide to have a salad instead because that's what my body is craving. But it's because I've learned to tune into my body and understand that and listen to it and honor that. That's where all of this mm-hmm. comes from, rather than choosing sort of an outside source to tell me what I'm supposed to need, because they don't know what I need. <laughs> I know what I need. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's this thing about morality. When you strip that away and you make food neutral, And you make it so that food is food and that an apple is not better than a cookie. Again, we're not saying that an apple doesn't have different nutrients than a cookie. But morally speaking, I can pick up an apple or I can pick up a cookie. Either way, I'm eating something and I'm doing it based on what I want to do and what I feel like I want for my body in that moment rather than trying to prescribe something based on somebody else's version of good or bad. One of the points that you you referenced within there that I think is so critical and was so critical for me is that idea that getting yourself back in tune with your body, because for me, the, my experience with diets was getting completely out of tune with my yep. body and following this, this list of, of rules. And so for people who are really in that space of I can't control this because I am fully out of control with Mm -hmm. food. And that idea, you talked about this a little bit, that idea of food and control Mm -hmm. and how those two things relate. How do you address, maybe somebody is like thinking about this, but they are so reliant Mm -hmm. on a diet and on that prescriptive Mm -hmm. nature 
and they feel so out of tune with their body. The very first thing is to completely validate that that makes sense. (laughs) If you are so reliant on a diet or a meal plan or somebody's version of, well, this is what you should eat in a day. If that's where you're at right now, that makes sense. And that's okay. I think what's important is to not negate anybody's experience and tell them that they shouldn't be doing that because what you're doing in this moment of going along with that meal plan and trying to control what you're eating, you're doing it likely from a place of, well, this is what is creating safety within my body. This is what I'm comfortable with. This is the status quo that I know and that keeps me safe. And so absolutely, it makes sense that that's what you're doing. So we start there. We start by acknowledging, okay, yeah, like here is this habit. Here's this thing that I'm doing. And I'm doing it from a place of deep down, this is what I believe is going to keep me safe and healthy. From there, the next step is really to start taking a look at what it is that you're doing, right? It's it's just acknowledging. It's becoming more aware of your patterns. It's becoming more aware of what are the thoughts in my head that lead me to eating that thing or not eating that thing? <laughs> what are the, the mm-hmm. phrases in my brain that I'm saying on repeat to myself on a daily basis? Where are those phrases coming from? This, I I call this sort of your body origin story. (laughs) Um, This is like what you start to learn probably in childhood about the rules of food and the things that are told to you. Like, for example, if your mom was always on a diet and was always telling you that white bread was the devil and you now refuse to touch white bread (laughs) with a 10 foot pole, (laughs) that makes sense it's important for you to acknowledge that and go, okay, the, the food rules that I have are X, Y, Z. And so a lot of the work really starts with just getting very clear and very transparent with yourself of, okay, let's move off from that autopilot moment of like just going through the motions and really start becoming this observer of your own patterns and your habits so that you can understand, okay, I'm doing this And here's why I'm doing it. And here's how it's serving me and maybe not serving me. And we kind of just stop there. That's the very baseline stuff of like, let's just open our eyes a little bit to what's actually happening on a day-to-day basis. Because from there, that's where we start moving in a different direction. But without that foundation of just acknowledgement and awareness, there's really nowhere else to go. That's definitely a a place that is so often skipped Mm -hmm. over in these conversations Mm -hmm. is sort of that first step of moving from this is something that I am successful Mm -hmm. at because you lost weight doing it or whatever Mm -hmm. it is tied to that control tied to some of that morality Mm -hmm. things that we're talking Mm -hmm. about is the idea of people pleasing Mm -hmm. and sort of when people are in this space of starting to unpack that and starting to have this different experience for themselves and they're taking those first few steps how do you address the voices that they're hearing, not only internally, but externally. Yeah. So this is where really starting to unpack and understand boundaries comes in. Understanding that, again, people pleasing, much like dieting, is a coping mechanism. It was a skill that you learned, likely in childhood, that led you to feel safe, right? We didn't, we weren't born (laughs) just like, (laughs) people pleasing and trying to make ourselves smaller through diets. These are learned behaviors. So people pleasing is really the art of putting other people's needs before your own. When you start to understand that that's what you're doing, it gives you this framework to go, okay, well, is this my need? Is this their need? And how can I make sure that I'm putting myself first and that I'm keeping myself as the priority? Unfortunately, and I think this is something that my brilliant mentor, Victoria Albina says, is when you stop people pleasing, people are going to stop being pleased with you. (laughs) And it's, it's unfortunate. And it's kind of just like the necessary messy part of all of this is that there are going to be people 
in your life that don't get it. (laughs) There's going to be people that aren't supportive. It stings and it's hard. And it's about kind of holding space for all the different emotions that come up with that and knowing that, okay, yeah, like if my mom is constantly on a diet and always talking to me about Weight Watchers and wants me to come with her to a meeting, like, what do I do in those moments? Well, you start to practice and create language for yourself around how you're feeling and how you're creating shifts in your own life. Boundaries are not about making anybody else do anything. Boundaries are about Mm -hmm. you creating yourself as a priority. It's about you creating parameters so that you can put yourself first. So perhaps it's a situation where you get to say, mom, I'm really glad that that's what's working for you right now. My priority is to start looking at food in a different way. Or you know what? Hey, mom, like, I appreciate that. I totally get it. Thank you for inviting me. I'm going to have to pass this week, period. Right? Like sometimes you need an explanation. Sometimes you don't. But all of it is really about you finding your own truth and being able to build up slowly but surely that confidence in putting yourself and your needs before somebody else's. You kind of realize how much, how integrated into your life some of those diet Mm -hmm. things have become and how I think particularly as women, we use diet and diet culture and the idea of losing that five pounds mm-hmm. and fitting into that dress mm-hmm. as a bonding experience. Yes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> and how ultimately like toxic that is. It's just, it's sad. It's really sad. And it just, I mean, there are times where I think back to, you know, times in my life when I was so stuck in that mentality. And I just, I like to say that I like became very evangelical about it almost. (laughs) It was like I was, you know, spreading the gospel and like everybody else could do it too. It was like my one personality trait. Mm. (laughs) To that point you said about bonding with people, there is a loss. There's a loss of that type of bond that you go through when you decide to do something different and to go against the diet culture grain. And I think what's important about that is finding community, whether that's locally and in person or on social media, but finding community in people that are also on this journey of unlearning diet culture, Mm -hmm. they're the ones who are going to understand why it's really hard to tell your best friend that you don't want to talk about keto anymore. (laughs) It's, Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's really hard. But when you're with other people who get it, I think that's what can help build your confidence that you're not alone. Building those boundaries and kind of first creating that. I think they have a different experience than maybe someone who's in a place like you are where you you have your boundaries, you have your mm-hmm. terms, you're, you're clearly very centered in yourself. I'm sure like everyone have your own moments. But when you are talking to someone or maybe it's someone in your in your life or someone you see online who maybe isn't as kind of far along in this journey or maybe hasn't even started, Mm -hmm. how do you approach that person with compassion for them while maintaining your own boundaries and your own compassion for yourself? Yeah. So, I mean, this happens to me a lot. I mean, I, I work full time in addition to my coaching business and, you know, there are people at my work who will still have kind of that diet mentality, even though they kind of know what I do in addition to my work, they, and they know that I'm very in favor of fat acceptance Mm -hmm. and sort of in this movement and in this space, they'll make kind of self-deprecating fat phobic remarks about themselves or about what they should and shouldn't eat and things like that. Oftentimes I, I find myself either just not saying anything (laughs) There's a lot of power in silence, I find. I also just kind of change the subject. There's different ways to go about that, and every situation is different. But the idea of having compassion for somebody that's still kind of in that diet mentality really comes back around to what we were talking about before in that, like, it makes sense if you're wrapped up in this because it is Mm -hmm. drilled into all of us (laughs) since before we were born, right? And so if you're seeing somebody else who is really still in that diet mentality and who really subscribes to thin equals best, you can start to reframe it and look at it from like, of course they are. Of course that's what they're doing. Of course that's what they subscribe to. It's everywhere. And just because 
that's what they are choosing to stick with doesn't mean I have to. Learning and giving yourself space to learn that it's okay to be different. It's okay to to move in a different direction and that you're going to come up against people in your life. Unfortunately, we don't live in a bubble, right? Where we can only in, mm-hmm. you know interact with people that agree <laughs> with everything that we agree with. And so it's about learning for yourself. What are your values? What do you really care about? What is meaningful for you? And learning mm-hmm. slowly but surely to, to speak on those things and to know when you feel called to speak on something and when you don't. I think there's a lot of power in knowing when it's time to just not say something. You're never required to teach anybody anything. So as much as you may feel called, especially very early on in this work, and I think I, I probably felt this way too, and, and you may have felt the same way, William, but when you first discover all of this sort of anti-diet movement and you start to learn and understand and unpack all of it, it can feel like, oh my God, I want everybody to know this. <laughs> like everyone has to know. Oh my God. Like, you've uncovered this major secret and it's like, oh my God, I must tell the world. And I think what's important is just like we talked about kind of meeting you where you're at, we have to meet other people where they're at too. And they may not be ready. We can't force our level of our journey on anybody else as much as we want to. (laughs) All we can do is really lead by example, show up for ourselves in ourselves and trust that if that person is meant to go on that journey too, that they will ask, they will say something, they will maybe be sparked by something that you've said or you've shared and they'll give you that inroad um, to make the comment or to share the information. But it's never your job to just out and out educate somebody without their consent. I, a few years ago, so it was actually just about a year ago now, I was um, getting a dress fitted for an event that was coming up and it was, I had had such a shift in my own attitude. So this is about a year into the pandemic. I had had such a shift in my own experience and my own attitude about it that I had a a year prior, because I had bought the dress pre-pandemic because the the event got delayed. um, I put the dress on and the zipper wouldn't Mm. go up. And a year prior, that would have devastated Mm -hmm. me. And instead, me and my friend who had kind of both gone on this journey together, um, I tried it on with her and she was like, yeah, we'll just do like a lace back or something like it's not a problem. And so we went to the seamstress and she ended up being able to get the zipper up and she goes, well, do you still want me to let it out? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to be able to breathe. So (laughs) letting it out would be great. (laughs) Um, And and she was like, well, you still have time. Mm. And my brain went, time for Mm -hmm. what? what are we talking about? Because the dress is very easy to change. And I was like, oh my God, she thinks I'm going to go on a diet and lose weight. That's hilarious. And like, it was a moment of realization how much my own mindset Mm -hmm. had changed Mm -hmm. that I wasn't already on a diet. Like I would have already been on a diet. And, And the best moment was I said out loud, oh, I'm not going to change my body. My body's not the problem. The dress is the problem and it's so much easier to fix. (laughs) Yes. I love that so much. Kudos to you. And the look, (laughs) the look of astonishment was like, just, it was so clear to me and it was such a different attitude that I never had before. It was so clear to me that it had never occurred to them that I could love my body fat, that this was the plan to keep this. That I'm just here and that's fine. (laughs) And it was, it was the moment for me was actually experiencing this brand new level of compassion of being like, I actually, that makes me sad for yeah. you that that's how you view your body. Probably, mm-hmm. even though you're much thinner than I am, the idea that, that I would just be okay with what my body mm-hmm. is, is so foreign to mm-hmm. you that it makes my heart break a little mm-hmm. bit about where you must be. At. Absolutely. And I've had experiences like that too, where it's like talking to people who have just been so indoctrinated in this and don't even realize that there's another way and that there's another option other than hating themselves and other than trying to be the smallest version of themselves possible. And it is really sad. And it's just so telling of how pervasive diet culture is, is that it just, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's the air we breathe, right? So it, it makes sense that these people are just so stuck in that way. And, you know, 
as much compassion as you're giving yourself on your journey to continue to give compassion to others that are still really wrapped up in it because uh, clearly for them, it's all that they know. And, and that's, it's sad, but it's, it's the sad truth, unfortunately. So to the Trump card that, that people often love to pull out, and it's definitely the Trump card in conversations that I hear about the idea of this body neutrality, body acceptance, mm-hmm. body positivity, whatever flavor you want to mm-hmm. use. It's the card that people go, well, <laughs> it's fine as long as they're mm-hmm. healthy. <laughs> The idea of like healthy at any size, and we'll put some resources in the description and all of that, but how do you sort of unpack that? The number one thing to know is that health is not a morality. You do not owe anybody your health (laughs) to be worthy of respect. And if you are subscribing to this idea that, well, I'm all for body positivity as long as you're healthy, What that's doing is discounting the millions of people that will never be healthy. The disability community (laughs) and the people that have chronic illness and people that just, no matter what they do, are never going to achieve whatever level of health is deemed socially acceptable. And I think oftentimes people don't realize that that's what they're doing, that that statement is inherently ableist, but it is. Um, and I know that at the beginning of my journey, that's something I absolutely subscribe to as well, because again, when you're starting to uncouple body size from health status and start to unpack, like what's the BMI and, you know, like all of the things that we're taught to believe about body size, when you start to unpack it and you start to learn more about the history of fat bodies and how, you know, the BMI was never intended. The body mass index was never intended to be used as a measurement of people's health, um, but has become that way. It's, it becomes a lot easier to go, okay, yeah, it, it makes sense that we were all taught and kind of sold a bill of goods, frankly, when it comes to what we're all supposed to be like. And when you say that I'm all for body positivity, as long as you're healthy, it's really discounting the idea that fat bodies can be healthy. Um, And it's Mm -hmm. discounting the idea that thin bodies can be unhealthy, right? You Mm -hmm. cannot tell somebody's health status by just looking at them. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that believe that you can, (laughs) Um, and that is inherently fat phobic. When you start to unpack all of that, it becomes a lot clearer. Um, There's a lot more education that needs to happen around that. I think it's it's starting and people are doing it, but um, I wish I wish there was more of it. I wish it was that much more mainstream. Um, I'm hoping that that's kind of the next frontier but we'll see. You mentioned there that really ties into some of the things that we were talking about before with even that idea of healing versus fixing Mm -hmm. yourself and Mm -hmm. all of those things is that level of individual responsibility Mm -hmm. that we put on people. The idea that you as an individual are responsible for forcing your body to be this idea of Mm -hmm. health. And I, I, I also think, and we're not going to, I tragically, we're not going to solve this on the podcast today. (laughs) Um, We could try. (laughs) I hadn't even really registered until I started seeing other people talking about ways to advocate for themselves in a healthcare situation, whether that be a normal doctor's visit or if they have some sort of chronic issue that they're dealing with and figuring out how to advocate for themselves that, no, it's not just my weight. This is a a larger issue. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips or anything that you've heard of or resources for people on how to kind of address those situations? Yeah. So, I mean, number one is to try to find a doctor that is health at every size oriented. It can be really tricky. Um, There are resources, um, including the health at every size directory um, through the Association for Size, Diversity, and Health in Healthcare. And I believe that database is being updated as we speak. So hopefully that's something that will be available to folks soon. There are also some great content creators on Instagram that tend to do like a crowdsourcing share of uh, great doctors in certain cities, particularly in the U.S. Um, 
who have been sort of vetted by people and people can uh, mm-hmm. vouch for and say, hey, I go to this doctor or my sister goes to this doctor and they're great. Um, so there's definitely some resources that I can share with you, Lillian, to share with your listeners too. Um, that's number one is to try to make sure that you are seeing a doctor that is understanding of this approach. Um, the second thing is if you're not seeing somebody that's in that approach, if you are struggling to be heard about whatever situation is going on for you at the doctor's office, uh, to really ask them, Hey, you know, if they keep bringing up your weight, if they keep talking about your size and telling you, you know, when you have X, Y, Z symptom, Oh, well, that's because of your weight. I would really encourage you to ask your doctor, okay, well, how would you treat this in a thin patient? Mm -hmm. If I was thin, what would you tell me to do? And, you know, you may not get the answer you're looking for. They may continue to push things like weight loss. Um, I've seen it happen. Um, And unfortunately, that's just kind of where we're at. But the more that you can learn to understand that Unfortunately, many and most doctors are indoctrinated in the same diet culture that we all are, and that they are literally told that, and this is what they learn in medical school, um, that size is a contributor to health. Um, And it can be really hard and confronting in that moment when you are trying to be, you know seen for an ailment or something that's bothering you and you're not being taken seriously, um, my best encouragement is if they're not listening to you is to find somebody else. Um, It's really hard to do it and it's not available to everybody and there's a privilege in that. And if somebody is not listening to you and they're berating you, your mental health is just as important as your physical health. Mm -hmm. And it's more important for you to feel seen and heard more than anything. One of the things that is tragically true in healthcare, uh, my experience is wholly in America. Mm -hmm. So at least in America is lots of different people have to advocate for themselves. And it's particularly difficult when you're dealing with your own Mm -hmm. internal process and you're going through all of these processes, Mm -hmm. but um, yeah, people are behind you and you're not alone in that experience in a lot of different ways. Yeah. And I think what's important to note here too, is that it becomes a lot easier to advocate for yourself when you're not coming at it from this aspect of self-hatred. When you have a much more neutral stance and you are accepting of your body and you're doing the work, that mindset work and the emotional work to feel better in your body, it's a lot easier to show up in those day-to-day situations, like at a doctor's office and say, Hey, (laughs) can we talk about this without my weight being involved? It's easier. I mean, it's not that it's not going to be triggering because it may very well be, Mm -hmm. but coming from that more grounded place, it's a lot easier to show up. One of the things that we sort of talked about with Mm -hmm. that mindset stuff is just the idea that you're not going to let go of that desire to be thin this experience and maybe even, I know I still experience it now. How do you sort of address that when people are sort of feeling that desire to still be thin? Number one, I think it's important to go through a grieving process. When you decide to stop dieting and to stop manipulating your body and stop shrinking in more ways than one, uh, it's important to grieve not only maybe the past versions of you that were smaller. Uh, But it's also important to grieve that future version of you that you had in your head. Um, Mm. Perhaps grieving the idea of what life might look like on the other side of those last five pounds. There's Mm. grief work in this. It's about learning, okay, how do I feel that sadness for this, this thing, this idea, this notion that, I could live in that type of body and grieving involves all different emotions. It's, you know, sadness, anger, denial. It's all of these things. And once you start processing those things, it gives you that gateway to start looking at when you have those thoughts 
about wanting to be thinner because when you live in a fat phobic culture like we do, it's no surprise when those thoughts cross your mind. They may not be yours and they may not be uh, something that you want to hold on to, but unfortunately we can't shield you from ever hearing those things and then perhaps taking them on to mean something about how you should move forward. But if you have done the work to kind of grieve the potential future version of you that's thin, what you can do in those instances when you you start going down the rabbit hole of, oh, you know, I just heard that thing and oh yeah, like I'm having kind of a crappy body image day and I just don't feel good. You get to look at it with a more neutral lens and go, all right, well, is this true? <laughs> mm-hmm. Is this true for me right now? Is that where is this coming from? Whose voice is that in my head? Right. Really kind of getting clear on where it's coming from and whether or not you want to believe in it today. And it's about choice and autonomy and agency and giving yourself the the opportunity to say, okay, you know what? I see you thought. <laughs> I see mm-hmm. that that message of, oh, you know what? You look so much better in that dress if you lost five pounds. I know where that's coming from. And if I were to subscribe to that, I would not feel like me. Mm-hmm. And it's okay that the thought's there and I'm allowed to put it down. <laughs> Yeah. I'm allowed to put it aside and I'm allowed to say, you know what? I see you. I see that you're there because what you're trying to do is bring me back to that status quo and that safety. But I've learned differently now. And you get to remind yourself that you've learned differently. And it's that constant sort of reminder system that you set up for yourself in your brain of, yeah, I see you. I see that stuff. And I get to hold that in one hand and my new thoughts and my new belief system in another hand. Yeah. I think that's, that's one of those things that's so hard to not compound Mm -hmm. your negative feelings with the feeling of shame for the negative Mm -hmm. feelings, because, um, Mm -hmm. you've had 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years (laughs) of building those thought patterns. And you've only had Mm -hmm. however long to build these new thought patterns. Yeah. And that's exactly it, right? Is when you think about how long you've had in that diet mentality and conversely, how little time you've had in this new paradigm, it's like you're dealing with a baby. You're dealing with a toddler (laughs) who's, you know, who's still learning and, and getting their footing and figuring things out. And so to have compassion for that toddler version of you that's still in this very early stage of development when it comes to this stuff. It makes sense that, you know, you would want to go back to that safer space, so to speak, of the things that we've always known. Absolutely. And I think that's so similar, that idea of like the phases of development. That's something I hear Mm -hmm. a lot about in the queer community and particularly the trans Mm -hmm. community of that idea Mm -hmm. of you're you're going back through these different stages of development and all of that stuff. And Mm -hmm. like with so many other things, (laughs) there's there's so many parallels between these different these different journeys and the way you, Mm -hmm. you address them. Well, we've talked a lot about the learning and the work and the grief and the, (laughs) all those things, which are all so true and so important and are so often what people focus on. But I think one of the pieces that I feel is really important to talk about, and I know I hear you talking about this is the idea of those new values that you get to bring in and the Mm. things that the joy and the community and all of those are the really positive things that you get as sort of a gift out of this experience and this work that you're doing. Can we talk a little bit about some of those positive things? Absolutely. Yeah. Let's lighten it up a little Mm -hmm. bit, right? (laughs) Absolutely. I think one of the things that I've really noticed in my own journey and the thing that I see in a lot of my clients too, is this really newfound, uh, gift of presence and just being present for your life and being Mm -hmm. so available to witness all of the things that are happening and be sort of an active participant in your day-to-day life instead of this sort of bystander who's just letting everything kind of move right past them. Um, You know, I've, I've heard from clients 
who will send me notes. I remember I had, you know, over the holidays, last holiday season, I got a message from one of my clients who was like, oh my God, we were making holiday cookies and I was with my kids and I didn't even like, it didn't even cross my mind Mm -hmm. that I shouldn't be like licking the batter. I just was with my kids and I was so just in the moment with it. And it was so wonderful. Or you get another, you know, note from a client that's like, oh my God, I went to the beach with my family and we were playing in the sand and the, you know, water. And it was just so fun. And I didn't think about my body once Mm -hmm. I wore my bathing suit and I didn't even think about it. And it's those moments. It's being able to like be out with my friends or, you know, going to an event and wearing something that makes me really happy and feel sexy and feel fun and not think twice about what anybody is thinking about my body or what I'm thinking about my body. I just get to live in it. And I think that's one of the greatest gifts of this work is that presence. And that's what leads to that joy. But when you're so wrapped up in other things, it's really hard to focus on those really joyful pieces and the people that you love. Yeah. I think it's, it is one of those things where you don't realize how much of your brain space and how much of your energy is being <laughs> taken up by that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there's, um, I know you have mentioned the idea of, of Weight Watchers before I did Weight Watchers. <laughs> That's yep. one of those where like, my God, did I spend so much of my time and energy? Cause I can just think mm-hmm. about that beach example. I would have been thinking yeah. about the snacks that we were going to be having. I would have been thinking about the oh. points I got for the activity of what we were doing. Mm-hmm. I would have been thinking about how I looked in the bathing suit and how a few months mm-hmm. from now I'm going to wear that other bathing suit. So that's really mm-hmm. what I want to wear. And mm-hmm. just all of that is gone now. I just get to be yeah. present in my life. And mm-hmm. I think there's so many examples of that as, as this really joyful experience. And I think speaking of things that you wear, I know one of the things I've seen some of your videos on is getting to wear what you want. And what are some of the Mm -hmm. things that, um, a part of you believed you needed to be thin to enjoy that you just enjoy now? Everything. I mean, (laughs) I, you know, I routinely wear crop tops. I routinely wear leggings that show my, you know, visible belly outline dresses, bodycon dresses, without shapewear. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, I wear whatever I really enjoy and like and feel good in. And I, it's such a night and day contrast to where I was before it, which is so interesting too, because, you know, when I think back to the time when I was at my smallest, I still didn't feel confident wearing those things. And I was probably, you know, you know, when I was the smallest I've ever been, about half of my current size, if not less. And I think about how, you know, I, I was so Mm (laughs) self-conscious about the clothes that I was wearing. Um, But it was like this very exciting time because it was like, oh my gosh, I could wear all these clothes that I couldn't before because all, you know, as we know, plus size fashion, it's come a very long way Mm -hmm. since I was in my teens and early twenties, but uh, you know, back at that time, it was hard to go shopping when you were above a size 12. Um, And I think now back to those days, and I think, gosh, like the things that I was wearing, did I even really like them? Or was I just buying them because I was so excited that I could fit into them? And the same thing would happen before I really started to do this work on my own journey when I would go shopping or I would buy things online, you know, in my larger body, I would get to this place of like, well, it fits. So I guess I better Mm -hmm. buy it. (laughs) And there was no concept of like, well, what is my style? (laughs) Like, what do I even like? What, what makes me feel like I'm, you know, having this creative expression of, of me. Um, And, you know, my wardrobe is considerably smaller than it's ever been, but it's all, stuff that makes me really happy. And, you know, there are still times where I'll come across an item of clothing and I'll think, you know, is this me or is this just something that I bought out of that desire for like that scarcity mindset of like, oh, well, I better get it now. Um, But I can have compassion for that version of myself that really wanted to be seen and wanted to wear the pretty fun clothes. 
Um, and I can look at it now and go, okay, yeah, like, do I like this? Do I love it? Like, how does it feel on my body? <laughs> like, how do I feel while I'm moving around in it? Um, and it's, it's just such a different, different framework and a different story. And it's really freeing, uh, yeah. to be able to put clothes on my body that not only fit me, um, but that I feel confident in and that I feel like are a true reflection of who I am. I'm sort of still figuring out what it is that I want to wear and all of those things, Mm -hmm. which is surprisingly way more fun than some of the other experiences that I've gone through (laughs) where I'm like, no, I get to like buy clothes and figure out what I want to wear and how things fit me. And what Mm -hmm. do I feel about that now that I am fully neutral about the thing that it's going on? (laughs) Exactly. And you know, what's so interesting too, I am, I'm very lucky and I live in Washington, DC and there's a local uh, group here that is a fat positive group. And we had a plus size clothing swap about a month ago and it was the absolute best. And I basically tripled my wardrobe from that experience. Um, And, but it's stuff that, you know, the sizes are all over the place. Like it's stuff that I never would have necessarily gone and shopped for, but you know, I brought some of my old stuff that I didn't want anymore. And people brought tons and tons of clothes. And it was just such a special day to be able to go through and try things on and see like, is this my style? How do I feel about this? And to have other fat folks just there sort of hyping you up too. It was a really great experience. So yeah, I'll encourage folks too, if you're in community with other fat people, um, consider doing clothing swaps or looking up stuff in your city. Um, because I think that can be a really fun way to explore without, of course, spending a ton of money. For people who are are listening to this and going, this is great. This is wonderful. We're going to talk about ways that they can access you and work with you, you specifically. But if somebody is maybe not at that point yet, they're, they're just starting this conversation. What are some initial steps that you would recommend for someone who this is sort of their opening point where they're like, you know what, I'm going to, I want to look into this more. I want to see what this is like. I think, you know, first off, social media is a great place to get acquainted with people who are in this realm. So whether that's following me, following other body acceptance uh, advocates or coaches or uh, dietitians, anti-diet dietitians, people that um, are really kind of doing this work, I think starting to follow those people and really curating your social media feed so that you're diversifying who you're seeing every day Mm -hmm. is a really, really great first step. Um, Another really great first step is podcasts like this one um, and other podcasts that uh, tend to focus on sort of an anti-diet lens. Um, One in particular that I really love is called Maintenance Phase. And they do kind of like a debunking of (laughs) health fads and diet culture stuff. And it's a lot of fun. Um, And they do like deep dives into different, you know, crazy (laughs) diets and things that have happened in history. Um, That's a really fun one. I know that Christy Harrison, who is the author of Anti-Diet, the book, has a podcast by the same name, I believe. Um, so there's so many resources and I think it's, uh, it's important to start just dipping your toe into listening and watching and learning and absorbing as much of that information as you can. And by doing that, the more that you do it, the more that you hear the same messaging over and over, uh, and the more that you hear it from different, from bodies that look the same and, or different than yours, Mm -hmm. um, the better off you will be when you really start to feel like, okay, yeah, I'm getting this and I'm ready to make the next move. That's so helpful. And it's that marathon, not sprint guys, um, of, of sorting it out and kind of taking those, those little step by step pieces to get to a point where you're, you're incrementally making those changes. The last thing I'm sure everyone like me is now obsessed with you. They're going to also go watch like hundreds of your TikToks today. Um, (laughs) But what are some ways that someone who's like, oh my gosh, I love Molly. I want to follow everything Molly does. How can they find you in the least stalkery way possible and ways they can work with you? (laughs) I love that. Um, Stalk away. Both my Instagram and TikTok are at Molly Goodman coach. And my website is just mollygoodman.com. 
ways to work with me now, the number one thing that I have going at the moment is my BYOB, Bring Your Own Body membership community. It's $33 a month and it's a really cool space away from social media that's built around creating connection and space for self-reflection in this sort of anti-diet body image, body acceptance world. Um, We have this private Slack channel where we chat about different things throughout the week. I give weekly journal prompts. And then uh, we also once a month meet for like a Zoom coffee chat hangout. We just kind of talk about anything that's coming up for folks. Um, We also do a monthly art journaling session where I guide folks through some art journaling prompts where we get to kind of be creative and let our feels out (laughs) in a creative, safe space with one another. Um, and so all of that is part of the BYOB community. And so that's kind of the the number one way to work with me right now. I am also launching a new group coaching program in the fall. So keep your eyes peeled for that. If you start following me on the social medias, you'll see me start talking about that fairly soon. And there's more information about all of that on my website and on my Instagram. It's She's an amazing follow. If you listen to this and you're like, yes. I need new <laughs> follows for my social media so that my feed makes me feel happier instead of makes me feel like I should just eat croutons all day. (laughs) Molly's a great, great follow. And I, I highly recommend following her. Um, it, it brightens my day every time I see her smiling face on my feed. So (laughs) thank you. I am also everywhere. I care so much is on (laughs) at care so much pod across Instagram, TikTok. It's on YouTube. It's on Twitter. You can find us on all of those platforms. Um, Every week we're back here to talk to another amazing guest about the thing that they are passionate about. And if you are sitting around and you're someone who cares a lot about something, you could talk for hours about it. And maybe you feel a little bit like nobody cares. I care. I care so much.